Praise the Lord, by your coming you perfected the old covenant and inaugurated the new. In your love you betrothed the church of all nations, and by your grace you built her foundation of Peter and upon the twelve apostles. Now make us worthy on this feast of the consecration and renewal of the church, to raise a hymn of praise and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. church and her children.
Christ, you are the fragrant chrism, and we ask you to accept this fragrance of this incense as a pledge of our gratitude. May the bishops, priests, and deacons who serve at your altars guide the church in your spirit. We glorify and thank you, Father, and your Holy Spirit. This is a symbol of the present 
in which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the worshiper in conscience, but only in matters of food and drink and various ritual washings. Regulations concerning the flesh imposed until the time of the new order. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that have come to be, passing through the greater and the more perfect tab tabernacle, not made by hands, that is, not belonging to this creation, he entered once and for all into the sanctuary, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. Praise be to God always. Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter said in reply, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him in reply, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. And so I say to you, you are Kepha, and upon this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I shall give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Messiah. This is the truth, peace be with you.
the high priest of the better things that are to come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. So on Consecration Sunday, this is the beginning of the whole new liturgical year. Technically, it's kind of an interlude. The season of the announcement, Subore, will take place in two more weeks and begin on the 15th. That will be all the preparation to celebrate the incarnation of the Word. What this festival is, is historically a connection with the building of the Church of the Resurrection in Jerusalem by Constantine. So in the early 300s, it's dedicated, it's built somewhere, I think, between 335 and it's dedicated in this year, so the building of Constantinople, the building of the Lateran Basilica, all these things are taking place in these early decades of the 4th century. And the Eastern Christians commemorated the, the consecration of the actual church building in Jerusalem. It was kept in commemoration year after year, not just in Jerusalem, which is the normal custom, but throughout all the churches, they celebrated the building of what is, in many ways, the mother church, of course, of the entire Christian world. But as the centuries went on, because of course that's 1700 years ago, as the centuries moved on, it began to have more of an understanding of the church, not as the building in Jerusalem, but as the church, which is that which belongs to the Lord, the assembly of the baptized, the church in her large sense as the body of Christ. And that's why this period now is about the consecration and the, and the a stopping for a moment before beginning completely the entire liturgical year around our Lord. And to stop for a moment and to consider all the blessings that God gives us within that reality that we call the church. Which is why you'll notice that the prayer at the end of the Husoyo is about gratitude, thanksgiving. Now in the Syriac tradition it has even more of a different connection of newness, because in the Syriac, the Aramaic tradition, it's very much linked with the Hebrew notion of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And so that's why the reading today is about the Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, the blood that's taken in. What St. Paul is describing in his letter to the Hebrews is essentially Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The one day of the year that the high priest, only one priest, only once a year, only for a moment. And in fact, very, um, that's not stunning, it's very surprisingly, or should we say very, ah, slips my mind now. Josephus, the historian, when he's writing, he writes about Yom Kippur at his time. So he's contemporary, more or less, with our Lord, Josephus. And when Josephus is writing about the people of Israel, because he's a Jew, but he works for the Roman Empire. So Josephus, when he writes about Yom Kippur, he talks about the awe in which the Holy of Holies, or the Ark of the Covenant, had been. When he speaks of it as being that place of the Shekinah, the presence of God, he says that there was a custom that the high priest, only being the only priest that was allowed to enter into that place ever, and then only once a year for one ceremony, taking in the blood, that he then sprinkled the ark with his fingers. That because of the awe and the, the majesty that they saw as this being this presence, that the high priest would be tied with a rope. So the idea being as he went through the veil, that if he was struck dead by that divine presence, nobody else had to go in and they'd be able to pull the body out. Do you see how I've escaped the word for what, how you describe it? It's not shocking, uh, but it's kind of breathtaking of the idea of the awe of the majesty, which for us was essentially an empty room. Because the true presence, the true holy of holies coming into the world is our Lord. So that's why St. Paul goes through, and that's why we think this letter to the Hebrews is not just written to Jewish converts, it's being written to Jewish converts who for the most part had been priests and priestly families. Because he's talking about things that for most people, they would have a vague notion of, the same way you have a vague notion of how the Vatican works. And so most of the Jewish people, they know the Ark's in the tabernacle, they understand that these other things are in there, they understand that. And so St. Paul says we don't have time to discuss all these things in detail. The most important thing for us is that the high priest has appeared among us. The high priest 
of the better things to come, the things that are promised. That's the meaning. So that's what links our readings and the, and the, the sensibility, if you like, of the Aramaic Catholic Church, the Syriac Catholic Church, with Rosh Hashanah, the new year for the Jews, which is technically in September, October. Or Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It was celebrated probably about a month ago. But it's linking together that same cultural attitude of the Syriac peoples who entered the church in their baptism. Now, when we have that understanding, one of the things that we want to stop for a moment is that over the last 150 years in the Western world, there has been a whole shift culturally from being to having to appearing. Meaning that up until the second half of the 19th century, so the late 1800s, people just lived their lives. You were an artist and you went to work, you worked in your, your blacksmithy, you worked in the fields, you did whatever you did, lawyer, whatever. You did your work, you lived at home, you educated your children, you were married, you did all of this. You simply lived your life. But at the end of the 19th century is the rise of Macy's, Lord and Taylor's, all of these major department stores who started coming out with the idea of how to make you buy more things. Why do you think to this day, I mean, the children may be devastated, to this day, you know, well, Macy's parade and everything and Santa Claus and what's going to happen at Christmas. All of this is a creation at the end of the 19th century to put you in the mood to open your wallets and to also teach your children to scream and cry until they took you, until you took them to the department store to see Santa. They're marketing employees. That's why Santa Claus is at the end of the Macy's parade. A store used to be just what it said, a store. There's a place in town with a merchant who had supplies. And you came in with your list, you asked for so many pickles, whatever you needed, and he would package everything up for you and you would leave. But that wasn't efficient enough. I have to make sure that you buy more things than what you actually need. And that's the birth of advertising. And that takes you into the 20th century, where now our being is not defined as just existing and doing what we do as being, you know, even especially as being Christians, receiving the sacraments and living our lives. That marketing begins to define us in the early part, and especially in the middle of the 20th century, with defining who you be, who you are, with what you have. That's the birth of suburbia. You need the bigger house, you need the lawn. If your neighbor has a pool, you need a pool. If they go to the Virgin Islands in the winter, you need to go to the Virgin Islands. So that what happened is we shifted in the culture that it became a defining aspect of not of our existence, but our existence was defined by what we had. So our houses got bigger. We all remember the house that you lived in when you were a child was really big. You go back to it now, wow, it's kind of much smaller than you remember it to have been because you're bigger now. But now, of course, we have two people rattling around in a 4,500 square foot house. Why? Because I define myself by those things. Things. Stuff. To the point where we have addicts especially in the Midwest, basements filled with boxes that we would be hard-pressed to name what's in those boxes in any great detail. There's a general notion, well, that's clothing, and there's, I think, some china over here. And, of course, what makes it worse, by the end of the 20th century, what do we do? We generate an entire business of building extra garages, store-yourself units, where now, because your garage and your attic and your basement is stuffed, you need to put more junk in one of these rental spaces. This is becoming insane. How many things do we need? But the problem why we do this obsessively is because we've been trained to do this for almost a century now to define our existence by the stuff that we own. But of course, that's not the end of it. Being, 
possessing, appearing. Now we've gone the next step where how we define our existence are through things like a Facebook file, profile, whatever you call it. We tailor a public image. You want to be a star? Upload your YouTube videos. Take photos of your lunch as if anyone really cares what you're going to eat. If they were with you at the meal, and you'll say, oh, this burger looks really good. Oh, it does. But no, no, I'm taking a picture to send to people who are anywhere near this restaurant. Because it's not so much about the burger or the chips or whatever it is that I'm taking a picture of. It's about how I am manicuring, tailoring a public image. So that becomes my existence. Now the problem with all of this, well, one, is it's just superficial and artificial. It's not me. But we've moved from really existing to existing, as they say these days, online. Which not even makes any sense, ultimately. But it is also satanic. Remember, shatan means adversary. And when we use it as a personal name, it means that being, which is in personal adversarial opposition to the Creator. And this is all satanic, because what happens from moving from existing and being and having a life, to defining a life by possessing, to defining a life by appearing, what happens in this mentality culturally means that everything is artificially crafted. That's what artificial means. It literally means making by art a technique. Photoshop, video editing. And so we change these things that literally means made up, artificial. But what happens psychologically and culturally is everything then has to become emotional. Everything has to... Who's going to watch a movie? It's why you don't watch Russian films. And no one likes Russian... Well, people don't tend to like Russian novels because one, they're 900 pages long. And there are a lot about, like watching the old movies before we entered into this appearing world, but it's part of the creation of the appearing world, are all those black and white films that have 15 minutes of just two people sitting at a table talking. Dialogue. Now, that's why your grandchildren don't like old films. You like them, they remind you of a different period of time. But it's boring. You see, people just talk. And in the Russian novel, you have six pages describing the solitary figure sitting in his parlor, looking out the window pensively at the teapot. And you'll just describe the clouds, you describe the window, you describe the curtains, you describe the table, you describe whether there's... You go through all of the description of something which is in the story real. But what happens is, it's like when you watch movies these days, the first ten minutes something has to blow up. You don't even know what the story is, but something has to grab your attention. Because in a world of appearance, everything has to be emotional, everything has to be drama, everything has, every mundane detail of my life must be an attitude of self-expression. Hence, logically, I take a picture of my hamburger, and I post it. Because every detail, we were doing this in the 90s with the Walkman and everything else, and we do it even more now with earbuds. Everyone just lives life with their own soundtrack. You ignore all the other human beings around, you just have music playing, you see them all over the place walking down the streets. And the reason why I say that this is satanic is not because I don't like Facebook, I mean, who cares, it's just technology. Because it is exactly the opposite of the Christian gospel. You know your catechism. And you know that the sacraments, the divine mysteries, they are outward appearances, signs. They are efficacious signs indicating something of reality that they effect, that they accomplish, that they bring about. That is completely opposite of everything has to be appearance with nothing behind it. The reality of the Christian message of Jesus walking in the streets of Jerusalem, the high priest of the better things to come, 
You see a man. So all you see is a man. The one who dies on Calvary, all you see is a man. But we know that existentially, being, that it is God, the Word, the Divine Son, who dies for the redemption of the world upon that cross. So that what the Lord God does is He takes things that we can see and hear, the divine mysteries, in order to bring us deeper interiorly. The satanic aping is to do it all opposite, where everything is appearance and explosion and outward with nothing inside. And so what happens is, one, you get all of your young people, the suicide rate going up, the bullying going up, you're fat, you're too thin, you're not athletic, you're all this bullying is because when you actually know the person in ninth grade instead of just the Facebook profile, yeah, she's different. You're too fat, you're too thin, you're not popular enough, you're, odd, you're not all of these things because, of course, all of the attention is the outward appearance. It is also the reason why you have an increase of all these dramatic shootings, because everyone in their mind, I have to do something dramatic in my life. It's the famous 15 minutes of fame in every person's life. Well, some people, mentally unbalanced, they're going, they want that attention in some way to be seen. I mean, you know in the class, this is not new either. You know, in the classical world, one of the eight great wonders of the world was the Temple of Diana in Ephesus. It doesn't stand anymore, and it was destroyed in antiquity. And we know the man's name. He did it on purpose because he wanted notoriety. So he set fire to the temple. That's these, it's the same thing, human psychology. But you notice on how the Lord God is, is to take us deeper into existence, and the transfiguration by grace and by light from things that we originally see to pull us into something that is deeper. So this takes you back to the idea of the presence of God in the Holy of Holies and why they would tie the rope around the high priest. Because if it strikes him down, that inner reality that we do not see, I'm not going in to get the body. You can't just leave it in there. So we have to be able to pull it out. But this is why in the world, culturally now, after 150 years of this movement, everything is drama. Everything is hyped up. We're not just having an election. This is going to determine the entire history of the world. If you don't vote this way, America will no longer exist as a country. If you don't vote this way, we're going to have a revolution in the streets. They're all guilty of it. Everything has to be drama because we live in a culture where everything has to be superficially cultured and cultivated through appearance. And as I say, when you analyze it, it is satanic. It is exactly the opposite ways of the paths of God. This is why so many of your families, your children, your grandchildren don't go to Mass anymore. Why? It's very simple. In a world of appearance, Mass is profoundly boring. You just do the same thing over and over. Why do they go there? So we tried to shift that a bit back in the 70s and the 80s, and you started getting rock bands in the Protestant churches to kind of keep the entertainment appearance aspect up. But even that becomes a dud. Why? Because human beings were creatures of routine. And if we don't accept that and think that all of us have to have individually lives that are going to be Alexander the Great, we are deceiving ourselves, obviously. I bring all of it up to understand that when we talk about renewal, renewal is about my life individually, concretely. Not by the things that I own. Those are the denunciations of our Lord, the wealthy of the world. It's easier for the camel to pass through an eye of a needle than the one who possesses wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven. And as far as appearances go, our Lord is always denouncing hypocrisy, the appearance. Touch up that photo, put it in. Oh, that photo on her profile, that's from 15 years ago. 
His beard's a little darker. He's got more hair. Yeah, you just kind of patch it all up. That's what our Lord calls hypocrisy. The word hypocrisy in Greek means an actor. So we've arrived at a cultural reality where, not you perhaps, but the culture that we live in is grounded in hypocrisy to act, to try to be something, to try to appear some way. And as a result, when we become so obsessed by that external, we actually never spend the energy to become something different. It's all about the profile. It's all about the image. So on a day at the beginning of the new year, we thank God for the gifts that He's given us. The light. Many of our prayers refer to the light. And God has never brought us anywhere in our spiritual lives to say, well, that's good. Now I drop you on your face. Because the more that God can get us to enter into the transformation of our being, the more He can tell us. So that we know that if our Lord has brought us to this day, if our Lord God has brought you to this day, November 1st, at this moment in your Catholic life, it's because He has so much more to give to you. And His desire is to reveal and to speak to that person, not to your Facebook profile, not to your storage unit, but to you, the individual, the person. And in that transfiguration, that is the reason why we talk about gratitude on this day. That we should be filled with thanksgiving for all the things that God has brought us and in order to bring us into. So I want to leave you with two quotations. They're both from the prayer of this morning's Safra, we call it, from the church's office. And in the incense prayer of the Husoyo, our Lord is referred to as living peace. And you are that order and that tranquility of order. You are living peace. O oh Lord, you are the living peace who has reconciled heaven and earth, the unseen and the seen. Because remembering that what St. Paul is talking about, he says that in the book of Exodus, we're clear that this temple, the holy place, the holy of holies, is a reflection of what Moses sees of the hidden divinity while he's on Mount Sinai. So the temple was always a place reflecting the divinity. But as St. Paul says in this epistle today, until such time as the reality was to come, and he says the time of the setting of things right, fixing things. And that's why the temple was destroyed in the generation after our Lord. It no longer served the purpose. And when a physical temple is once again built in Jerusalem, you will know that that is the major sign of the presence of the Antichrist. And so, divinity is reflected in the temple, and the temple reflects the reality of the living peace to come, as St. Paul says, the high priest of the good things that, are, that have arrived. And so that's why I leave you with the last line from the Masmoral, from the hymn this morning. Let it ring from the mountaintops. Rise up. You heard it throughout all the Husoyo ceremony. Rise up and be clothed in light. For your light, with the capital L, your light has now come. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and the imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord, kind Savior Jesus Christ, in his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered, for all the, intention, for the intentions of the Catholic Extension Society and its donors. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Thanks to you, now and 
Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, it now and shall be forever. Amen. You have united the world. You
Thank you, O Lord God and Father, and we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins and the glory of your holy name, and that of your only Son, and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So on this great day of light and of gratitude, knowing that it is hard to be stripped of our stuff and our illusions and our appearances, it is good to know that we have the hidden God with us to bring us these better things. And also for the consolation to know that there are many others who labor in this pathway of our Lord's Gospel. The most recent Maronite voice has come out, so please grab a copy of it as you go out and see that you share with the Maronites across the country these labors in basking in the light of the Lord in gratitude. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving hopes of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen.